very pleased to, to be able to, to be here this morning and to tell you what happened to me at that time. But first, I'd like to give you a little background of my life before this thing happened to me. I grew up, was born and grew up in southeastern Mississippi on a farm. I completed high school there uh, in a small town and had uh, begun junior college. But at that time, the Korean War had just started, so um, being a patriotic citizen, I quit college and uh, joined the Army and spent 20 months and 16 days in combat in Korea. But after receiving an honorable discharge from the military, returned home um, and didn't further my, my college education, I had fell in love with a young woman and uh, shortly she became a wife and we've been together all these years. But anyway, I had uh, started work in a large industry there in uh, Laurel, Mississippi, uh, not too far from my home, and I had continued there for 14 years, working my way up into management. And for different reasons, the company uh, went under, had to, to go out of business, had too much competition in, in that field. But anyway, um, I moved to my family to the Gulf Coast in Pascoola, Mississippi, um, to, and, and uh, started my career as a shipbuilder. And shortly after, a few, about five years afterwards, in 1973, uh, a friend of mine, his uh, son, had come down to that area to go to work, Calvin Parker, and I was a foreman in the shipyard, and he had, uh, had started to work for me. And knowing that from, from back home, we grew up with my kids in Jones County before we come to the, to the Gulf Coast, but and knowing uh, Calvin, he, and him knowing me, he knew that I liked to fish occasionally, so we had planned on a Thursday evening to go fishing in October. And we had, had, uh, had reached the river, the Pascal River, and we had fished for a couple hours after work, and it had become dark, almost dark, and we were sitting on a pier fishing out into the river, and I heard some kind of it seemed to me a hissing sound, like it could have been steam or air escaping from a pipe. And as I turned around from the pier and looked, something had, had come almost to the ground. It was hovering probably two foot, 18 inches or two foot from the ground. And and uh, I, I assume Calvin had heard the, the noise at that time. He turned to look, and there was some kind of door, a sliding door, I suppose, that came into the, the end of the craft that was toward us. And a very brilliant light came out of the craft. And I didn't know what to do. It startled me at first. I couldn't, couldn't uh, make out what it was. And uh, about that time, there was three things began to move into the doorway. They came out the beam of light, came right up to uh, Calvin and myself, and one took hold of this shoulder and one of this shoulder, and I seemed to rise up from the ground about the height that they were, and we proceeded to go into the craft. This time I saw Calvin wanted to take a hold of him and I saw him go limp and I didn't know at that time but he had fainted, he had passed out. But anyway, they continued to carry me aboard this craft and as we went in the doorway into the light in, in the room, or the compartment, it appeared to me that it was round and the light was glowing from the overhead, from the floor, and from the, <clears throat> from the walls. Um, it was so bright I couldn't see anything at that time. But we seemed to stop about the middle of, of the room, and they they left me. It, it, by this time, I couldn't I couldn't do anything because I couldn't move. The only thing I could move was my eyes, and I could tell that they had had released me. But I still wasn't touching anything that I could tell. But something in front of me, in the wall in front of me, it, it seemed to come out of the wall. It was probably uh, this big. It, it appeared to me that it was a big eye, and it moved up toward my my face. And, remained there for a, possibly a few seconds or a few minutes, and it moved downward, and I'm having to assume that it went under me and came up the backside, because the next time I saw it, it come over my head, came back in front of me again, remained there for a few minutes, and moved back into the wall and disappeared into the light. 
But at that time, uh, that was all that I could see in the room. But several years later, after going under uh, hypnosis regression, uh, I could recall that there was something, some type of window there in that room. There was possibly another compartment that there was something else in the other compartment, it appeared to me. But these things left me there suspended for a while, and after, after a while they came back and, and uh, they took hold of me and uh, carried me back outside and they didn't just throw me down, they, they seemed to just release me and I fell to the ground. And about this time I saw Calvin, he was standing there by the river and his arms was outstretched like this and he appeared to me that he was in shock. And I don't know whether he had been aboard the craft or not, but there wasn't anything with him. He was alone at that time. So I was trying to make my way to him. I, when I fell, my, my legs were weak. And uh, after a while, they, shortly they began to, the feelings began to come back. And as I was trying to get up, I was making my way toward him to see if I could help him. And when I reached him, he didn't even realize who I was. He was, he was going in shock. And I had to shake him. I even had to slap him. and and scream and, and holler to get him to realize that, that uh, you know, that we were all right, I thought, that they hadn't done anything, any harm to us uh, physically that I could tell. But after a while, I, I got into where we could talk, and, and I assured him that, and, uh, um, that we, I thought we were okay. But meanwhile, while this was going on, I heard the hissing sound again, and as I turned and looked, this craft, the blue lights was flashing again, and it just seemed to disappear. It went up. It moved that fast. So after we talked the thing over a little while, we decided we wouldn't tell anyone. We didn't know what it was or, or what it what it could have been there for. But the more I thought about it, I thought it, it, it might be a, a threat to our country. So we stopped at a pay phone on the way home, and I called uh, the Keyser Air Force Base in, in Biloxi, which is only about 30 miles from there. And um, briefly, I was telling what happened, and they, they stopped me and told me that they didn't handle those things. We would have to go through the Sheriff's Department. Well, we talked about that, and certainly we didn't want to go to the Sheriff's Department. We didn't want to be called crazy or nuts in the neighborhood there. But again, we, we talked about it, and I, I just couldn't keep it. I didn't think I could keep it to myself. It was just, it was so, you know, something happened. So we called the Sheriff's Department. Uh, and I talked to the sheriff, Fred Diamond, <coughs> excuse me, and he asked us to remain there that they would send, he would send a couple of deputies over to talk with us. So after a few minutes they arrived and I think they at first thought we were nuts, but after they they begun to realize that, that you know, something had happened to us, they asked us would we follow them to the sheriff's department to discuss it. So we followed them in our car to the sheriff's department and after uh, talking with them, uh, several hours, um, they were finally convinced that something did happen. And I think what probably convinced them that, that something had happened to us, when we first went in the sheriff's department, they removed Calvin to a, a room by himself and, and a, me in a room by myself and uh, interrogated us, you might say. And later they came back and brought Calvin in the room with me and they uh, went out to get some coffee. And we didn't know they had left a tape recorder going in a, in a desk there, and they had taped our conversation. And I think after listening to that, did they convince them that something uh, had happened to us. So I asked the sheriff that night that, um, I, I told him that we didn't, we certainly didn't want any publicity about it, that, um, you know, I had a position in the shipyard and I had to be back at work that morning. It was almost time to go to work at that time. But anyway, he assured me that there would be no publicity about it at all. And I went home that night or that morning believing that. And I had reached the shipyard after going home and having coffee about all the time I had to thing to do. But I, I went to work that morning and after reaching the shipyard and I proceeded to get my people to work and come back to my office, my telephone was ringing. And it was some uh, news media in Jackson, Mississippi, wondering what had happened to Calvin and myself the uh, night before. So I didn't know what to do. I just hung up on him, and, and uh, it continued to ring, and, and uh, someone answered the phone, and the sheriff was trying to get us to come over to the sheriff's department that they were all being mobbed over there. So many people was over there. So it, it alarmed me. I didn't, you know, I said, well, I didn't know what to expect. 
because uh, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what they were. But anyway, uh, we went over to the Sheriff's Department, and it dawned on me that we could have come in contact with radiation or something. And uh, I called their attention to that, and they carried us to, to the Singing River Hospital there at Pasagoula to be checked for radiation. They didn't have the, the uh, facilities to do it with. So they called Keesley Air Force Base, and uh, they told them to bring us over there. So I think they were alarmed enough that when we got there, they had MPs that met us on at the gate, and uh, they had evacuated the, the area that we were going into, and the area that we were going to be uh, tested, they had uh, protective clothing on. So they were alarmed that you know that something had had happened, and afterwards they. Uh, after they had uh, did examined us for radiation and they didn't find any, they said they thought they had found a little radiation on Calvin. But anyway, they uh, we went into a meeting with the top brass at Keesler Air Force Base and uh, I could tell in the questions that they asked us, they were quite concerned that they had asked a lot of those questions before and probably had answered uh, similar to those before. So anyway, they told us that they would give us a copy of the meetings of the uh, that we had there, and they never did. They classified it as as um, classified material. But later on, uh, I obtained a copy of it from a mutual friend, from a colonel that had retired there at the Air Force. But they were quite concerned. Keys the Air Force Base fault. But anyway, then the news media picked up on it, and um, it just. It went out all over the world, and we didn't, we couldn't get any rest or any sleep three or four weeks. And um, Calvin, a couple of weeks after then, he had a nervous breakdown. He was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Uh, they wouldn't even let me see him for a long time. Um, and he's continued to have nervous breakdowns it, it, as time goes on. He can't seem to get over it. But later on in, in that year, or the early part of the next year, in January, um, I, I'm really an outdoorsman. When I'm not working, I, I, I do a lot of fishing and, and a lot of hunting. And there happened to be a tree farm there, close by uh, my home, that to about 750 acres that I spent a lot of time on in, in hunting and fishing. There's a fine stream with a pond there. But I had gone back in there uh, fishing, uh, hunting on uh, in January, and I was sitting down under a, a, a hickory in a tree, squirrel hunting, and the same craft that I, Calvin and myself had seen in Pasadena came down in an area uh, close by me. And up until then, I was very frightened. I, I was afraid to go out at night by myself. I, I didn't know uh, what was going to happen. But they just seemed, I was uh, sitting down under the tree, it just seemed a voice came to me that, uh, to not be afraid that, that they didn't mean me any harm, that they would be another place or another time. And um, it, it frightened me all of a sudden, but then I, I immediately got up and went straight home. My, my wife was alarmed that, <coughs> that I didn't continue my, my hunting, so I told her what happened. But all the fear was gone, that, that, uh, that these things didn't mean us any harm, that I, th I thought in the future I would get to meet them. And in the May of that same year, in Mother's Day, we had uh, gone up to my, my father's farm up in, um, um, uh, further up in Mississippi to spend a day with my mother. And we were coming home late at night, my wife and myself and, and uh, three of our children. And we had a terrible experience. We were, they thought it was terrible. We were coming in a, in a area that was not very populated, that wooded area off the main highway coming home. And there was a light that kept following us. And later on it came around in front of the car and come down, was coming down in the road to land. And and uh, when my wife saw it, she, she just became hysterical. And uh, my youngest daughter at that time, uh, she was a baby. In fact, she graduated from high school this year. She came along late in life. But anyway, she was quite young, and she was asleep, and it alarmed her, and she had awakened and was screaming. My wife was screaming. But this crab moved back up to the end, into the sky, and it moved around to, the, to our right. 
and moved out into a field and came down and lit the entire area up and had a row of lights all the way around the craft. Well, we had stopped the car by that time, and, and uh, I was trying to get out of the car. I, I knew it was my time to meet them. And before I could get out of the car, my wife was screaming, and my youngest son, and, and she held me and wouldn't let me out of the car. So then the voice came to me again, you know, this is not the time. It'll be another time. And we left. My wife became so hysterical that we left, and we, I could see looking back that the crab was still there hovering when we left. It was a lot, lot larger crab than what Calvin and myself had seen. But anyway, they wanted to, uh, someone wanted me to call the key to the Air Force Base, but I said, there's no use. There's no use of notifying anyone. There's nothing anyone can do. It's something I have to, to, to handle myself. So we didn't tell anyone about this over a period of years. And I a lot of things that I can't talk about is kind of personal that we've had other encounters since then. It's come to a point now that the tree farm that I had mentioned, um, there's very few people that goes into that area. And when I, I've been there many times, I go there many times now, and that's where these things contact me. I have a feeling that I have to go there. When I go there um, alone, um, I go there for that purpose. And they have painted a beautiful picture to me that what a world could be without pollution. Um, that we're, we were on the verge of destroying ourselves on nuclear hydrogen energy. And they were, if we didn't stop this, if this wasn't stopped or something wasn't done about our environment, that we would be, could be destroyed again. But I think now that um, it seems that there is being something done. We notice the threat of, of uh, nuclear or hydrogen energy is beginning to fade a little bit. Communism is going away. Uh, people are taking more interest in our environment and the pollution that we're putting in the air. air. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just a little bit hoarse. But I think we do, we are going to see a world change that, that uh, we're going to find answers to our pollution of our environment. Um, I think the threat of, of nuclear and hydrogen energy will go away. These things have told me that this is something that's way out. I mean, it's hard, it's hard for me to stand before you and tell you this. But it's, it's something I've kept to myself for a long time. But there's an energy out there that we haven't discovered yet. It's an energy that, uh, for instance, the movement of the planets in our universe, in our solar system, there's an energy that moves these planets. And I think they've learned how to tap this energy. It's, it's something that's there, it's free. And I think in the days uh, to come, in, in, in the very near future, that we're going to tap into some energy that, that's going to make everything else obsolete. I think we're going to see a much better and a more beautiful world to live in. And also I'd like to say while I'm talking with you that being reared a, a hardship Baptist in, in uh, South Central Mississippi, um, I simply, we only, we simply lived in our own little world. I didn't believe or even think about these things until this happened to me in Pascoola, Mississippi. Uh, I certainly didn't believe in reincarnation, but I, I believe in reincarnation now. I think I've lived before and, and I'll live again. Um, I think this world is, we, it's been destroyed several times our civilizations has been destroyed it was on the verge of being destroyed again but i think we're going to make it now from, from what i can on the indications that i have but um it's something that has really uh, I, I, i'm not a, a religious fanatic i never have been but i certainly believe in in god and i think that uh, god in all of his greatness uh, didn't only create this little world here. He created all those worlds out there in, uh, in this universe and the ones beyond. There's no end to it. It's a revolving thing. And I also believe that we were uh, planted here that something that's greater than we are that come under the jurisdiction of God has us here as an experiment. 
we're direct, we're indirectly from God. And I believe that maybe the experiment might work this time. Hopefully. So, I'm gonna. I, I, I'd like to leave you with that, and uh, but I'm open to any questions that anyone anyone might ask. But um, I will. I would like to say this that uh, it's made me uh, a lot better man than I was back before 1973 to know that there are life out there, and there's a good possibility that that life is going to help us grow and into something that will never be an end.